Good evening, everyone. My name is Teresa Scandifio, and I'm the Director of Adult Learning and the Programmer for the In Conversation With at TIF, here at TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this evening's In Conversation with Karan Johar. A few reminders. We ask that you please put your phones on silent. Taking photos or recording video is not allowed at any point during the event, but we encourage you to tweet using the TIFF hashtag TIFF16. During the audience Q&A, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our guests. We ask that you wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. This evening's In Conversation with the event is part of an ongoing series brought to you by the adult learning, TIFF's adult learning team. Our initiatives provide audiences with a platform and opportunities to watch, talk, and learn about classic and contemporary cinema through in-depth, on-stage conversations. Amongst other, other things, adult learning offerings include masterclasses and in conversation with events with high respected artists, filmmakers, and subject experts who inspire a deep understanding of cinema and culture. Outside the festival, these events take place at our year-round home, TIFF Bell Lightbox. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce your host for tonight's event. Noah Cowan is the executive director of the San Francisco Film Society. Prior to this role, he was my boss, a pretty incredible mentor, and more broadly, our fearless leader as the founding artistic director of our year-round home, TIFF Bell Lightbox. And before that, he served as the co-director of the Toronto International Film Festival. Noah also co-founded the pioneering distribution company, Cowboy Pictures, and the nonprofit funder and educational distributor, Global Film Initiative. He is the executive producer of Jem Cohen's film, Benjamin Smoke, and the co-curator of multiple exhibitions, including David Cronenberg, Evolution and Transformation. Please join me in welcoming our host, Noah Cowan. Raises up a little bit. Hi, hi there. It is indeed my great pleasure to be hosting tonight's In Conversation with Karan Johar. You'll see there actually is a little San Francisco spin to the films you're gonna to see tonight, um, believe it or not, so we'll, but we'll get to that a little bit later. The format for today is, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna show a clip, um, Karan's gonna come out, we're gonna talk maybe for about, gonna try and talk for about 45 minutes and then open it up for a nice long question session, so I'm sure you'll have lots to ask him. Um, Karen Johar is, in fact, one of the leading and most influential figures in, in contemporary Indian cinema. Um, he comes by this uh, very naturally. He grew up kind of a, as a film brat um, in the film world in Mumbai and um, was kind of immersed in film culture from a very young age um, and sort of knew and knows a lot of the, the players um, you know, from a very, very broad spectrum. Um, and as a result, he actually learned many of the crafts of the field. He, uh, um, you know, everything, of course, from directing to writing, but also um, he's a very talented costume designer as well. Um, so we talk about that a little bit as well. His films are very distinctive. Um, he's gravitated to a highly entertaining style, but with a very kind of intimate feel. I feel like many of the best scenes in his films involve two people kind of sharing a private world against the backdrop of sort of a larger and you know, more colorful and song-filled life. Um, his, uh, say the least. Um, besides being a celebrated director, Karan Johar is also a television personality and a talk show host. His Coffee with Karan it has the distinction of being the most watched English language talk show on Indian television, so we're going to enjoy turning the tables on him a little bit tonight as well. <laughs> so it all starts um, uh, when he was 25 years old, uh, quite auspicious uh, as for such a young man, in 1998, um, with Kuch Kuch Hatahe, um, you know, one of the... <laughs> Okay, um, and uh, um, you know, wonderful film that uh, um, really broke him, and um, you know, it's one of the most successful films of all time. Um, before I bring him out, I'm going to show a little clip from the film. Um, um, it's great fun what you see here, but it's um, the, at the result of a moment of great tension in, in a love triangle. Um, this is a kind of a class, one of those classic love triangle movies, and um, you'll be seeing that one of the characters is being challenged. Um, see whether she actually can sing in Hindi. Please roll clip.
Please welcome Karan Johar. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> Ah, that was embarrassing. <laughs> that was really embarrassing. You can't leave me in, the, in a dark room and show me that. <laughs> I mean, I was all of 24 years old when that happened. I cannot be held against that. I mean, that, that just not fair. It's not fair. Let's, let's, go, let's go a little before that, though. Um, uh, I want to hear about you growing up in the film business. I mean, obviously, your dad was an important producer, and um, Yash Chopra you know, is your, your <coughs> uncle, one of the most famous film directors and producers of all time in Indian cinema. What was it like? Uh, my father was a film producer. Uh, his name was Yash Shohar. And uh, though we grew up in, a, in an area that was very far away from where the movies were really made. Uh, I grew up in an area in Mumbai which was called South Bombay. Then it was Bombay, it wasn't Mumbai. Um, and uh, it, it was no one in my neighborhood watched Hindi films. So I was a bit of an anomaly. I mean, you know, I, though I came from a film production home or a family, but I was surrounded by kids that just didn't watch the movies. But something about the, my mother really used to make me like tilt towards Indian cinema because she heard a lot of Hindi songs. Okay. So I became completely obsessed by Hindi cinema to the extent that I was a bit damaged by it as well. <laughs> uh, uh, I, would okay. sit, I would close like my, my bedroom door and listen to Hindi film songs and dance to them on my own. Uh, no one asked me, no one nudged me, no one wanted me to do this. <laughs> I was always just crazy Hindi film fanatic. Like that was what I wanted to be. That was the world I just loved. I lived vicariously through those visuals. And at a very early stage, I discovered like great filmmakers like Gurudath, um, uh, Vintage Raj Kapoor, Abhimal Roy, Yash Chopra, the magic and magnitude of Yash Chopra. Uh, I just grew up just loving Hindi cinema and I knew nothing else. My world was like one big Hindi film. I was as dramatic as them. I was as melodramatic as them. Um, I even had an interval in me. Uh, I, 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 was, I was completely obsessed Is that how you described by Hindi cinema. <laughs> And every time I, took, I went for a shower, it was like I was in one of those rain sequences. Right. <laughs> and, and every time like, my mother would like, reprimand me, it was like my reaction was like turning to camera and giving that, <laughs> that shot. Like, it was, I was just organically, completely, and unabashedly Hindi filmy. And you know, that was just who I was. And I didn't want to kind of run away from that fact. So I grew up in, in a neighborhood that didn't understand my passion. But I was silently like, just obsessing about Hindi cinema. And then there came a time where like, the decision of career decisions came up. And my mother sat me down and said, like, you know, just like your father, you're a really bad businessman. And you, know, <laughs> and you haven't inherited my Sindhi, which is a community back home in, in India, who are known for their business and monetary skills. She said, you haven't inherited that part of my personality. And what are you going to do? And I was like, I think I want to make movies. And I think she nearly had a meltdown at the idea. <laughs> because she said, what are you going to do? Do you even know where to put the camera? And um, that's when I began assisting my best friend Aditya Chopra, and um, I entered the world of cinema through his eyes and his father's eyes, Yash Chopra, his father, and I realized that there was a family very opposite to mine who was so worried about my future, and all they ever did, the Chopra family, all they ever did was obsess about Hindi films, okay. and I think that is what, what sucked me into that whole zone, and I realized that that's really my calling, that I'm going to make movies. That's fantastic. Um, I do have this wonderful idea that um, if you'd been a, born a little bit later, we might have seen some of those dance sequences in your bedroom on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you've seen me dance anywhere, everywhere else, anywhere. And I'm, I, I mean, uh, not that I plan to right now, but, um, but, uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, this is the problem. Like, which other filmmaker do you even expect would break into dance anywhere else in the world, right? It's only just me who can do these things and, and actually think you can put it on. But, but, yeah, so it was, it was what I, I just love the, the music of Hindi cinema. I mean, who doesn't? I mean, to me, I find a deep connect. I think to me, why do you need to go to a therapist when you have a Hindi film song to go to? <laughs> I mean, it's very simple. I, I always say that. I was like, that's Hindi film music is my therapy. It's been my catharsis. It's been the energy that surrounded me. I mean, it's who I am. I'm defined by Hindi cinema. Now, when you conceive yourself as a filmmaker and you're writing, and there are, I mean, you made a touchstone of some of the, you know, the great Hindi film directors 
directors of all time. I know in particular Raj Kapoor is of great interest for you as, as, right. a, as a, a classic Kapoor especially. Because um, there, there is something about the intimacy that your characters feel with one another that's so compelling. Obviously, there's an audience of people who love those and love the, you know, the, the sort of love and the passion, but also you know, the complications and difficulties that they have with each other. Uh, is, that, is that coming from him, especially? Or there, do you think it's sort of a range of filmmakers? It all began with me loving the cinema that I watched yeah. and I, my emulation, my absorption, my, my wanting to be in that zone led me to make Kuch Kuch Hota Hai, which is actually um, a blend of various things I've loved about Hindi cinema. You know, it has some of Raj Kapoor's vision in terms of its scale in the second half specifically. It has some of Yash Chopra's nuance, a relationship nuance, which is the intimacy that you address. Mm -hmm. uh, Yash Chopra was actually known for that one-on-one -on -one contact between two protagonists and the things they said that were layered. Uh, all our life, uh, um, all our lives are full of uh, the gray zone. We walk the gray path. We're never in the black and white zone. We're always in the gray. And I think Yash Chopra uh, very beautifully kind of uh, always addressed the gray zone, whether it was in his moments in films like Kabi Kabi or Silsila, in Lamhe, in Chandni, uh, so many of his vintage work that was so stunning. Always there was baggage and emotional baggage that the lead protagonist carried with them and brought them to the table. Like there's a scene in Kabi Kabi between Shashi Kapoor, lead actor, uh, Amitabh Bachchan, living legend, uh, Rakhi, most stunning actor. All three of them are in the frame, and there's, a, there's a, like a past history between Rakhi and Mr. Bachchan in that film. And Shashi Kapoor is her husband of the time. And it's just that layer, that sub-layer that goes through that moment, which is something that I absorbed and even emulated in a film like Kabi Alvidana Ken, a kank, like we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course, when I addressed infidelity, it created a storm of its own. You know, and someone told me, how can you endorse infidelity? And I was like, how can you endorse something that's already sold out? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, I, mean, it's infidelity. I mean, it's just that we can walk around brushing it under the carpet, but dude, it's a reality. Yeah, like, uh, like, who's faithful? No one. <laughs> it's a great setup for our next clip. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, take a, we're gonna take a quick look, actually, at one of those, the key moment in, in Kabikushi Kabigam, where the, um, the protagonists realize that there may be something afoot with their mutual spouses. Please roll clip. Kabi Alvita. You know, Raul.
My, my apologies to all the fans out there. I actually got my notes backwards. So of course, I was talking about Kavi Alvira and Nakena. And before that, we saw, saw the clip from, from Kapi Kushi Kavi Gam with um, the wonderful Amitabh Bachchan. Um, we did pair these clips together because they, in some ways, kind of both form different kinds of, um, and sort of different approaches to the idea of social, social critique or just sort of taking a look at society in a new way, in a very contemporary way. Completely. One was about loving your parents, the other one was about leaving your wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there are two, I would imagine, different approaches. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, but both, um, you know, created controversy and sort of stirred things up and had people talking about well, it. Well, not Kabi Kushi Kabi Gam was more like, uh, I was in a different headspace then. It was back in 2000 when I wrote the film. It was about my, my feeling of reverence towards my parents and the value system they gave me. And we are defined by the morality and the values that our parents teach us. And I believe that very strongly even today. That's why I believe that bringing a child into this world is a humongous responsibility mm -hmm. because the right and adequate parenting is like what defines us as people. Uh, but it was six years later that I felt the need to push the envelope and mildly tear it, which is why I made Kabi al Kena, which was a commentary on, on marriage, on reasons why people get married, sometimes for the wrong reasons, and how you could step out of the boundaries of your marriage uh, for sometimes no reason at all. That was questioned when the character of Rani Mukherjee actually did not love her husband, Abhishek Bachchan. Um, and it was questioned, but why? Why? Why doesn't she love her husband? He's a wonderful man. He doesn't cheat on her. He, he does everything right. He loves her madly. But there's something called attraction. There's something called uh, sensuality. There's something called not having uh, sexual compatibility with your spouse. That is something that is just brushed under the carpet back home sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's no longer a criteria. You may not be attracted to your husband for whatever reason. And that is considered a taboo point of conflict to have, which I never comprehended. And that was a problem even back home. The film did fantastically with the diaspora, but back home it had a very mixed reaction. It had an extreme reaction. I had people like really getting angry and upset. And, and I remember watching the preview of the film, and there was an elderly couple watching it right in front of me. And it was the preview. And at a point when Shah Rukh checks into the hotel with Rani, uh, obviously to have sex, um, uh, uh, the lady turned around to her husband with a startling look like, what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And the husband looked at her and said, oh, it's a dream sequence, don't worry. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that gave her immediate relief. Right. You know, that, that Shah Rukh Khan can't be having sex with anyone but his wife. It's right. not possible. And uh, when they realized six minutes post that, that it was not a dream sequence, that they actually checked in, um, that it was, it was like in a requirement of uh, or what you know as a booty call, um, uh, uh, that it, they were so aghast and appalled that they got up and left the cinema. And I knew at that time that I'm going to have this diverse reaction to um, this subject. And then I met this lady outside who had brought her daughter freshly out of a divorce situation, depressed, distraught, had come to watch a current Johar film to find happiness. <laughs> and and, and uh, she had to be subjected to Kabi Alvida Nakena. And her mother has come and screamed at me outside that cinema. And she says, I brought my daughter to feel good. Look at what you've made. And she's weeping. And I stern, and there was this pillar. And this girl was standing by that pillar and weeping copiously. And I was like, I felt like going and hugging her and saying, I'm so sorry I made Kabi Alvida Nakena. <laughs> but it was just the way it was. It went with these diverse reactions of people telling me that, oh, in the West, you know why the film did so well? Because they can actually go and see a film alone. Uh, you know, you don't need to take your spouse. Because there were like husbands and wives who turned around and told me that, oh, when I told my husband I really liked the film, he would say, oh, really? What did you like about the film? <laughs> and vice versa. So it was like you couldn't have conversations that you liked Kabi Alveda. So you had to lie that you liked the film. Uh, because in India, watching a film is a, is a family outing, you know? So there would be just awkward rows of people watching Kabi Alveda, like. <laughs> and and, and in, in here, the culture is very different. You can actually go with your friends or go alone and sit in a cinema hall. That doesn't happened in India. Did the blowback from the movie kind of affect you personally at all? Like, was it, was there any, did you have any difficulties with the press? Well, there was, there was a lot of extreme reactions. And no, the press was, was kind to the film. In fact, it got some really great reviews at that time. Um, but it's so amazing that that film breeds, for me and my, in, and my career graph, it breeds the maximum in retrospect. It's today the people who were in their 20s who judged the film are now in their 30s and married and understand it. You know, and they understand that you could go through these sub-layers, these traumas and tri tribulations in your marriage, and you know, that, that, that there should be no judgment at all. The problem is we as a community, we judge everything. 
for no reason. We're just judgmental. And you know, and you cannot watch a film like Kabi Alvitana Kena if you're going to sit on judgment seat because it's pretty much a story of so many lives. Mm -hmm. Our homes sometimes, our neighbors, our life, our environment. Mm -hmm. But we tend to kind of sit on this, uh, on this high moral ground for no reason. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's credited for opening up like a, the ability to talk about a lot of other things, you know, right. and, and, and in many ways, Hindi cinema's really, you know, been able to explore so many other things. Um, so you t must take some credit for that and sort of see that as you sort of see other careers and especially some of the younger filmmakers developing. Right, so a lot of the alumni is credited to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Um, so uh, obviously you've been working with some of the, the, the finest stars in the world over your career, um, but in particular the relationship with Shah Rukh Khan I think is something that people talk about um, and how special the performances that he has in your film. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a look at a My Name is Khan clip in a, in a few minutes, but I just before we get to it I just wanted to sort of talk about that special relationship, kind of how it developed and what your working relationship is like. Well, it all began when I was an assistant director in Dilwale Durane Le Jayenge. And I was the costume assistant on that film. And I had met Shah Rukh Khan just about like just once or twice before. Um, and I was very innocent and naive and I didn't know how you were meant to talk to movie stars. I was a producer's son, but I wasn't really exposed to that part of the world a lot. And I was very earnest and uh, I went up to him with, the, with these, he was wearing these very loose Wrangler jeans at that time. <laughs> and, uh, and girls in my college were crazy about him. And uh, they, they used to think he had the most beautiful posterior. Uh, uh, so uh, I very innocently told him that you should wear Levi's jeans, you know, because my girls in my college think you have a really nice. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he was like, I think a bit shocked because I don't think anyone had said this. Yeah, and the other thing I said, I said, you should show your Adam's apple because girls like that too. You shouldn't button your shirt up. He thought I was mad. He called Aditya Chopra, the director, and he said, who is this assistant who is giving me these strange instructions? Uh, so that was my first meeting with Shah Rukh Khan, which was about discussing his posterior. <laughs> and and it, was, it was kind of strange and subsequently we developed a really strong bond that was creative because he found me really funny and he used to like jam with me on the sequences and he would constantly like take my feedback and, and sitting on top of a mountain one day he looked at me and he said, you know, you should be a director. And I was like, yeah, I will eventually in six or seven years. I want to I want to AD on many movies. I want to assist on many movies. He said, no, you should do it next year. Write a film, come to me and I'll do it. And it was as simple as that. And what began subsequently was a journey of tremendous faith and friendship. Just two people, actor and director, who understood each other's syntax, ethos, every, each one's every beat. Uh, Shah Rukh and I have an amazing working rapport. I haven't directed a film with him in the last seven years, uh, but I, he did a scene for me recently in a film that, I'm, that is going to release uh, in Diwali. And after seven years, when I directed him, I realized nothing had changed. Like he knew exactly what I was expecting of him and I knew exactly what he was going to do. We realized, and Ranbir, who was the lead actor of the film, turned around and said, he's like, you know what you guys have is like an aspiration for an actor to have with the director, which is a complete understanding of each other as, as artists. And I think uh, we have tremendous respect, a tre a great regard, and a solid friendship that uh, may have been through its own journey, but the eventual result is, is that bond that is, that is unshakable. It's so interesting, you, it, just understanding sort of the creative relationship between an actor of that magnitude and a director of, kind of, your, of your skill is always so interesting because you, know, you obviously have a really great vision for the films that you, that you make. Do you, would you talk to him um, sort of during your ideating stage, like during the time when you're kind of coming up with an idea or a treatment for a film, you know, kind of knowing that he was in mind? Well, we did a lot of that for My Name is Khan uh, because it was a character that was unusual. It required a lot of work, a lot of, lot of research. I had researched the film extensively. Uh, we needed to do a lot of like, you know, like readings and like, like um, workshops, etc., which we've never done before. Charuk and I had an understanding that I would give him the scene and he would come in and create his version of, of, of the scene and I would like kind of look at it holistically. Um, we never did a lot of workshops, and, but on My Name is Khan is where we really developed like a strong connect on the basis of off the research that I had. That was an exciting film to work on because it was Shah Rukh Khan not being Shah Rukh Khan. He was playing Rizwan Khan, the character. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, that was when we realized that certain films require a different kind of work pattern. But before that, when we had worked on Kabhi Alvida or Kuch Kuch Hota Kabhi Kuch Kabhi Gam Kal Hona Ho, um, none of that really had us like jamming a lot on the film. We used to talk a lot about it after, uh, during the edit stage or when we were ready, but never during the process. It was always more organic. 
So my name is Khan. It's a remarkable film, incredibly courageous, um, um, sort of beloved not only in, in India and South Asia, but also um, you know, throughout, um, th throughout the world of cinema and, and cinema critics. We're just talking about its rapturous reception at the Berlin Film Festival right. when, you, when you premiered it. Um, um, truly, there's, there's, it's a unique film in, in the, sort of the history of Indian cinema um, and starring Shah Rukh Khan, um, set in, in a large part in the United States and beginning in San Francisco. Um, and um, you know, really kind of chronicling a, a, a man on the spectrum, um, kind of really talking about 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 um, kind of expressing himself as a Muslim, you know, in the uh, United States, and um, in this remarkable scene um, towards the end of the film, um, you they sing a song to sort of speak to maybe some of the issues that we're even facing today as we uh, enter into the U.S. presidential elections. Please roll clips. <laughs> A remarkable film, not only at its time, sort of dealing with Islamophobia and in, in, uh, you know after 9/11 and the kind of the social un, uh, upheavals that that caused, but back in the news, um, you know, eight years later, as we start to uh, um, kind of enter into this election with some uh, kind of crazy politics happening south of the border, um, what do you think? What do you think? Looking back at the film, looking back at the clips, sort of continuing to think about it, you know, is, is its impact, its lasting impact, and how do you think it can speak to what's going on today? Um, well, I think it's the, the fact that you just said the relevance of the film continues, which is saddening. Mm. It, this was not meant to be relevant today. It was hopefully a series of, of films and discussions and events that would hopefully subside with time. The fact that there is a political situation that is actually bringing up this whole phobia all over again is disheartening, is saddening, and it, it doesn't feel empowering at all. It just feels very sad. I did a lot of research before I directed My Name is Khan uh, extensively to understand the religion, the misinterpretation of the religion, the depiction of it, and you know, it was a very tiny baby step that I wanted to make in the world through an artistic way uh, of communicating what I strongly believe um, is, should be a secular world. And everyone must be allowed uh, their belief, but of course, without any kind of violence or any kind of political upheaval. But it has always been disturbing when I know that certain political forces and movements actually enhance the fear enhance the phobia and actually contribute to it, sometimes knowingly and many times unknowingly. Um, and, and I don't know, but there is, there is just very little that, 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 that makes me feel that there is any, that it makes me feel like the, the quotient of hope has reduced considerably, especially with what's happening in the United States of America. Um, and when I read and when I see and when I hear, I'm like, you know, you don't feel, you feel like, why should there be this feeling of fear? My Name is Khan was a human drama, but it was also commentary of our times. And I believe very strongly in the ethos of the film. And I feel, as I said, very saddened that that, that feeling of ethos and that sense of fear has not reduced at all. Um, how, did, how do you feel the film landed when, you, when it was released in India? And has, how do you think it's contributed to the political conversation there? 
Well, I don't think any one piece of work can really contribute tremendously. You can just add up to it. And in my own way, when I travel all across the world, I have so many people that I know that the film has touched, you know, in terms of so, so many ways. They've come and thanked me, held my hand, and thank you for my name is Khan. Not only on a humanitarian or religious basis, but just in terms of the feeling the film was communicating. I'm not, I, I don't take, I can't take credit for anything because one piece of work, one tiny piece of artistic work cannot change anything, but it can work towards it. And I, that's what I always tell filmmakers, like we have a responsibility as well. Entertaining is a huge responsibility, making people, going back, like I believe some of my cinema, some, you could, some could call it just entertainment, some could call it like it made me smile and laugh. And that itself is, a, is an achievement in today's day and age. Um, my name is Khan may not have moved mountains politically, but it definitely moved mountains emotionally to a large section of people. People. And I feel grateful that, uh, to that reaction, and I feel proud of the fact that I went ahead and made a film like this. Fantastic. Um, there is a book coming out um, that uh, we published this fall, um, sort of about, that written by you, about you, about your life. Will you tell us a little bit more about it and what we can expect? Uh -huh. Well, it's called An Unsuitable Boy, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, it's pretty much about me right up to this point of time in my life. It's an honest, candid, um, like, uh, account of my life. And what do I say? It's got everything in there. What's wrong, what's right, what's right in between. Uh, and, and everything that I stand for, what I don't stand for, my fears, my insecurities, my anxieties, reasons for my celebration and happiness, um, you know, my, just my honest take on my life and my environment. And uh, I hope that whoever gets to read it, um, I'm not, it's not like an overtly motivational book. It's about the mistakes I've made. It's about the times that I've fallen and the times that I felt like I needed to rise or rise to the occasion. It's about everything to do with me. So if you're interested in me, you'll be interested in the book. <laughs> and if I bore you, you should read it. <laughs> um, you're working with your production company right now. You, you do work with some younger filmmakers and, um, um, and I know mentorship is very important to you. Um, right. What do you think about the, the, the uh, contemporary Indian film scene? What do you, what's making you feel uh, positive and what's making you feel fearful? Um, I'm positive that we're dabbling into new genres, that we have some new energies and new talent that are doing new things. Um, I'm afraid that we're not empowering our writers enough. So our content is suffering. Uh, the writing is really poor. And I think that's because we don't empower the writer the way, you know, say Hollywood does or various other cinemas of the world. I think we just take that for granted. We believe the director is everything. It's not true. The writer is the soul of the film and the, and the director must contribute to that soul. Uh, but we don't empower our writers and that's my big failing. And, and I soon feel like, I really believe it, I soon feel like uh, I hope uh, that digital won't be the patriarchal parent and television will not be this, the mother-in-law, and digital <laughs> and, and film will eventually have to be the troubled child. And I don't want that to happen because that's a scenario of 4C and it, it makes me very afraid. But on the flip side, on the good side, there is so much amazing new talent trying to do, I mean, the last couple of years, I've seen some really spectacular films in films like Piku or um, in, in films, uh, like, like even the recently recent film that we made, I'm very proud of Kapoor and Sons. Um, it was really a really amazing film. Um, <laughs> Completely, uh, completely different from, uh, should I just say Fawad Khan and you'll clap louder? <laughs> uh, I call that, I knew it. <laughs> See, you guys, uh, so yeah, so from Kabi Khushi Kabi Gam to Kapoor and Sons, they're totally two different syntax of, of family. Like Kapoor and Sons is, is like totally dysfunctional and speaks <laughs> of our times. Kabi Khushi Kabi Gam is the epitome of like the happy family. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, as I said, content like that, like so much new age content making the way. I mean, what I was really proud about, the fact that Kapoor and Sons actually has a homosexual protagonist mm -hmm. and his coming out to his mother, his traumas, you know, his dealing with that aspect was done in such a sensitive manner that, and it got accepted by large numbers. Uh, the fact that it was such a big success shows that the audience has evolved much more than many filmmakers have. Mm -hmm. And I feel ashamed of so many of us from the fraternity that haven't recognized how, how mature an audience space has become and more power to the audience. And where do you think... I agree. And do you think, where, did, where do you think that the uh, that sort of growing maturity has come from? Do you think it's... Uh... Evolution. It right. had to happen. And our lack of recognizing it. We're all, some of us, still stuck in a time warp, including myself. I mean, I, I try very hard to be relevant and push the envelope sometimes. But sometimes we fall into mainstream uh, prerequisites. Like, we need to do this because this is commercial. We have to do this because this does the numbers. Sometimes, you know, you calculate everything. You manipulate everything. You kind of scheme your way through mainstream cinema. Whereas, actually, there is such an 
evolved, mature audience ready to accept what's new if you just make it right. If your screenplay is watertight, your performances are extraordinary, the packaging of the film makes you want to connect to the characters in a certain sense, you can actually achieve brilliant cinema and not sell yourself or your soul in cinema and pretend just for the name of commerce that you're doing this because that's just ridiculous and regressive. Well, you've actually been absolutely one of the, the example of how you actually do that, which is incredible. And there's a new film. Um, it's coming out in one month. Would you, we have a short teaser for you here? <laughs> would, would you like to set that um, up for us? It is a film called Edil Hai Mushkil. Uh, it's everyone's story. All of us have <laughs> suffered in love. Um, <laughs> and unrequited, one-sided love. I, I feel I'm the brand ambassador of that emotion. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, I've really fallen in love with someone who's loved me back. Uh, and I feel like I've been... <laughs> Well, I feel like I've been traumatized with that emotion, and I feel like this is an ode to myself. Um, <laughs> without the self-indulgence, of course, it tells the story of one-sided love, um, uh, and, and I've just taken that emotion and extended it right through the film. Uh, the film is, is really with Ranbir, uh, Anushka, Eshwarya, and, and Fawad in a special part, um, and it really is all about like the angst of like falling in love without the reciprocation of it. Uh, to, I mean, without divulging too much, that's pretty much what the film is about. And I believe that there's so much angst with love all around me, and I love that, because uh, I think Hindi cinema has contributed to that angst in such a beautiful manner. Like, <laughs> even like when, when you're brokenhearted, you know, you're listening to a sad song on your iPod, and, and that is so filmy, but that is just what it is. Yep. I see myself also when I hear Lag Ja Gale, which is my favorite uh, song. It's a Madan Mohan composition, and every time I'm kind of brokenhearted and sad, I indulge myself by listening to that song and pretending I'm getting over my emotions. Whereas all I'm doing is being theatrical and melodramatic for no reason. Uh, I think that's the great part, like we started off discussing, the greatness of Hindi cinema is that it allows you a vicarious existence into emotions in a way like nobody else does. Absolutely, let's roll clip. Coming soon. <laughs> um, we can turn up the lights and start taking some audience questions now. Um, there's lots to ask, I think. We have a lot of big fans and a lot of people already ready to go. We have one over there. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. OK, first question. Will you have drinks with me after? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, are you asking me out? <laughs> Why not? It's Toronto. We have a, a lot of great bars. Um, I have to ask you, especially after watching that, uh, that clip, what comes first? Is it the music and the songs, or is it uh, the storyline? No, the story, definitely first. That dictates the situation for the song and the music. The first thing you do, I mean, I don't just randomly start making music uh, uh, and then saying, okay, put that in and now write the scenes. Uh, it's actually the story, the thought, the screenplay, and then the situations for the song or the placement of that is a result of your narrative. Fantastic. I'll send my number down. All right, okay. <laughs> That's great. Yep, got one over there. Hi, Gary. Hi. Sorry. Uh, my name is Heather. Uh, I'm a Pakistani Canadian professional um, and also a TIP volunteer. So my question to you is, we can see that Fawad in your movie and there's a big influx of Pakistani actors coming to India. 
Ali's sitting over here, over there, he's another Pakistani actor. Um, <laughs> what's your take on that? Um, who do you think are going to make it big from Pakistan and India, like an actor and actor? You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't look at it as an Indian actor or a Pakistani actor. I think Fawad is a tremendously talented actor. He could be from anywhere. Uh -huh. You know, it, uh, it, for me, he's such a tremendous talent that when I saw... I, I, my mother, I have to tell you, was crazy about him when she used to watch his show. She was watching Zindagi Gozara and Hamsafar, I think, twice or thrice. And one fine day I sat and I ate dinner with her sometimes and I was watching Zindagi Gozara and I just felt like he had the most riveting pair of eyes. Like he just spoke volumes with just one one stare. And I realized that there was such tremendous talent. And I was so happy he accepted the role in, in Kapoor and Sons, which was, I might tell you, rejected by six lead actors in the country, wow. in India. Six actors said no to that role because they were probably afraid of the consequences, which really didn't happen. And Fawad was not only a great actor, but a brave actor. So I felt really proud of his bravery. And when he turned around and told me that one of the reasons he did it is because his wife told him he must do it. <laughs> and I felt that it was even more amazing. Uh, I mean, more power to wives like that. Yeah, I know that Bollywood is full of really silly wives. So don't say the right things. <laughs> Karan, do you actually want to elaborate a little bit on your casting process? Because uh -huh. it's, uh, it's kind of amazing the, the, what you're able to assemble. So well, where I does think, it start? Well, it starts with you kind of like wanting a cast. And then if you don't get it, you go to your option two, three, <laughs> and after that. It's pretty much where it happens every world. You know, I have no ego about like going to multiple actors and, and even begging them if I really want them to do the film. <laughs> it's okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yep. Got one there. So Karan, the extension of this question, Given that you have a big audience outside India, uh, do you ever sort of you know, look at sort of you know, giving chance to people outside India? If the role demands it, sir, of course I would. If the role demands it, it's as I said, talent does not. So, so, so the who, talent who, doesn't have a nationality. So you know? who does the casting for you? Uh, we have casting directors. Uh, okay. There are particular casting directors that work on every film. And the casting director is a phenomenon that has actually kicked off in a big way back home in India. It's now a big force to reckon with. You know, we have some really prolific names that do some tremendous casting. Yeah, so we depend on them a lot. So that's, that's been a transition over the last couple of decades. Into yes, that's casting. been new. That's been, as I said, it's been new. Yep. Uh, hi, Karan. Hi. So, uh, when do you decide, like, do you want to make a film? Like, what is the motivation behind, like, okay, I have to start a film now. Like, what is it that motivates you to start a film, actually? Hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that, because it's a thought you get. It's a thought you get that culminates, you know, eventually. Uh, the thought that translates into a story and then into a screenplay. The motivation is always creativity. You know, with me, it's never like that I'm going to plan a money-making film. You know, that should be event the eventual result, because if we are a balance of commerce and art. We all want to make money on our movies. You know, I'm not here for any form of charity. I'm here to make money as well. Uh, but, you know, the process has to be organically creative from within you. So the process begins when you think of a story, then that becomes a screenplay, and that finds you cast it and you make a feature film that you know will have a certain kind of syntax that will uh, resonate with a wider audience. But do you, um, is, there, is there a special place you go to get creative inspiration or does it just well, happen in the shower I walk or whatever? Streets. I know, I, I like to walk streets of cities like uh, out, of, out of my own mm -hmm. so that I get time to breathe literally. So I, I, I walked streets of London and New York and tried to be very creative. I, I have a strange process. I was just telling him. Um, I was telling someone this afternoon, we did an interview with Anupama Chopra today in the afternoon, and I was telling her that I actually talk to myself when I'm actually walking the street, so you could think I'm completely a <laughs> lunatic. Uh, <laughs> because I, I even shop while thinking, and I sometimes have looked at a jacket and started talking to it, and, and when, when the shop and the salesman comes and says, do you need help, he means that in two different ways. Sometimes, <laughs> you know? uh, because sometimes it means like, you know, you really need help. Like, you know? uh, and yeah, so I have a really strange process, which I do not recommend at all. I <laughs> I don't write, I talk into my, into my dictaphone or my phone, okay. and then somebody transcribes it for me, and then it eventually results in what you've seen. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yep. Hi. Uh, uh, welcome to Toronto. Thank you. A uh, couple of quick things before I start with my question. Uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, all the best for Edil. Thank you. And uh, my name is not Khan, but I can't thank you enough for making my name is Khan because I can, I can very well see the impact it has had, especially here in the West. Thank you. Thank you. Now about the question. Uh, you know, when we look at it in ma mainstream Hindi movies, uh, basically every, anybody who is, uh, everybody who is anybody is coming from a film family these days. Uh, there are a few people who, who generally pull their weight, Ranbir being an ideal example of that. But personally speaking, there seem to be a few people who, who seem to be just like shoved down our throats. So what is Dharma doing, basically, 
what is dharma doing to to create a sustainable gene pool in mainstream hindi movies <laughs> <laughs> what is dharma to sustain my gene pool <laughs> maybe <laughs> Well, I would wish I could contribute to that. My gene is kind of ending right with me, I think. Uh, there's no, no one to take that legacy forward. I don't have any siblings, so I'm not... Do so there's no nepotism happening internally at, at Dharma Productions, you know. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I do agree with you that it's a fairly nepotistic industry. They have, a, they have an easier access to the movies than others. Some have actually come on, like Ranveer Singh and other actors. Like, in fact, the biggest movie stars of the country have not been from within the film fraternity. Amitabh Bachchan and Shah Rukh Khan are big examples of actually big movie stars who haven't been from the movie industry and have gone on to become living legends. Uh, currently, the scenario is such that we tend to kind of cast a lot of people from within the industry because of access. But there is, as I said when we talked about casting directors, that they have actually brought so much new talent to the fore, like Anushka Sharma, not from the movies, Ranveer Singh, not from the movies, uh, Fawad Khan, not from the movies. Uh, so many young actors actually not from the film industry and actually doing phenomenally well in the movies. So that, that trend will change and I think talent will soon take take over nepotism. As far as my own company, as I said, that, you know, it's just me and, and after I'm gone, uh, hopefully I have designated an efficient force of people who will take the legacy of Dharma Productions ahead. I really hope that happens. A different kind of family. It sounds great. Yep, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Karen. Welcome to Toronto. Thank you. Um, you know, from host, from, of course, directing movies to hosting talk shows and talent shows, do we have any other surprises uh, that you're going to uh, leave us with, maybe in the future? Shocks, you mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know what else I could do. Theme park. Pretty much. I had a few items on my bucket list, which I think I've all I've done. Now, just getting better at those things. Making movies, my dear, is really my primary passion. And uh, I just want to make a movie every two years and not take too many gaps in between. That's my big contribution to myself. Because I think that I tend to kind of do so many things that I don't give time to what I really love to do. As I said, my primary passion is, is directing films. And that's what I really want to... So those will be probably the happy surprises hopefully coming your way and nothing And else. we love you for that. And just following that invitation uh, of drinks, could I have coffee with you? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be of doing a lottery later. Yeah. Of course you can. <laughs> Who we got here? We got someone over here? Yep, go ahead, sir. Hello. Hi. So first question would be, um, how is it like working with Renbeer? And also, how can I AD on your next film? <laughs> <laughs> Rambi is one of the finest actors of our generation. It was amazing. He's also a friend of mine. Working with him was like working with a friend. He's easy. He's, he's just, what do I say? He's a genius talent. I mean, you know, you put that, like, there is nothing to say. Um, he put, like, when you see Adil Hamushkil, it's just that one close-up that he sings the song in. When you see the so longer song unit, he's held that song for a minute and 45 seconds, and he just holds your attention. And that itself is, it tells you, like, his level of talent. It was one take. Sorry, the, how many takes did that, was uh, that? So? It was one take. Yeah. And, you know, we decided we won't take another. And, you know, he had his own process about singing that song because he's, he's stone deaf like me. We can't sing at all. So for him to pull off a singer with this level of conviction, it takes tremendous and paramount talent to do that. <laughs> How do you be an AD? There, well, that's a process that, that we have a whole kind of a division that looks at people <laughs> who can get into being an intern. I don't look at that myself. Uh, what, be, what exploded in that division is when Varun and Siddharth, who were ADs, became actors. Everyone thought that that was the way to kind of become <laughs> like, like a, a film actors if you become an AD. Suddenly we were like, we get more applications for being an assistant than, uh, than to be an actor. It's only because that was their route you know, <laughs> within the movies. <laughs> Thank you. All right, do we have any, is this, I don't think you need a job, right? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's a process question, a little, little long in preamble. Um, uh, when you, I think you have a remarkable talent in expressing uh, the um, uh, quotidian way of uh, saying and getting that work out of your actors. So then the question is about a screenplay and how do you interact with a screenplay and how do you uh, make it so uh, universal? Uh, the, the example comes to my mind is uh, Joan Michael Hayes, who worked with Hitchcock for uh, brilliant scripts for Rear Window and uh, Strangers on a Train and, uh, and North by Northwest, outstanding, witty, uh, banter, right. so uh, you you are almost there. If you have a, you you, you really <laughs> should be putting some uh, there. script script um, uh, you know contribution. 
but but would you kindly tell us how your process of working with the script and uh, I you you've mentioned the name of, of legends really and I don't think I'm quite there at all uh, I make very different films that are about human relationships invariably they're written by me or in conjunction with another writer uh, and they're drawn from personal observation and life observation and also characters that I seem to have met in my journey of life and many of those have made like protagonists of my films and sequences and sequence of events which is what screenplay is has come from within it's organic it's intuitive i don't know about whether it's good or bad but it's the way i work it's like i construct a story i write the scenes and what comes to me naturally then there are certain prerequisites which is music and those that i believe very strongly in myself and i put that together um, whether or not it's genius or it's great, I think greatness is always something that you uh, talk about in retrospect. So I hope like three decades later, uh, I hope I'm an example and not just a comma, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the history of cinema. Actually, I'm curious, like as a writer, do you actually like, um, are you one of these people who kind of agonizes for years and years and years, or does it kind of pour out of you at once? No, it's just very, it's instinctive and it's immediate. Okay. I, I don't like, for anything that festers, I don't have the patience for it to last within me. You know, my own sense of like, you know, patience from my own thoughts is very limited. <laughs> so I need to kind of, if I think it, I need to make it. Got it. Yep. Hey, Karen, how are you? Hey, hi. Uh, it's, it's. Pleasure to have you here in Toronto. Thank you. Uh, it's been, I don't know, since you have started directing films, uh, my family and my friends started connecting me to you because my name is Karan too. Oh, okay. And my wife's surname is Johar. So <laughs> they call me Karan Johar. So it's like, <laughs> my wife is right here. <laughs> I rarely meet anyone who has a last name Johar. So hello. Oh, yeah. And one hour. Back, we had no plans to be here. We, we just came to know you were coming here, and we just moved in, purchased tickets, and pleasure to have you here again. Thank uh, you. My question is, uh, it's more of a understanding from your point of view, right? We, what I understand is we have two parallel actors, or the genre of actors going on in Bollywood. One, I would say, Fawad Khan and Ranbir Kapoor. Second line, I would say, uh, Nawazuddin Siddiqui, who are more of into intense acting, who are not into more of a looks kind of stuff, right? So what is your take? Where is the industry going, having two parallel lines? For Nawazuddin Siddiqui, you have more or less kind of budget films, but they perform really well because of the acting and the content of the film. Whereas you have Ranbir, backed by Dharma, you know, no limits to the budgets, for sure. And both are p performing well on the box office. So where do you see from these two parallel lines of genre actors, where the industry would move ahead? Uh, well, Nawazuddin Siddiqui, Irfan Khan, tremendous talents. There's so many of them that are amazing talents. And yes, a lot of them are unconventional in terms of the way they look. And so they, their talent lends itself to a different kind of zone of cinema. But they're doing phenomenally well. Nawazuddin is such a genius actor that you put him in any role and he completely forms that part. And there's so much scope for him. And I want to tell you where the evolution of cinema is at because two decades ago, Nawazuddin would have had an even tougher time to make a mark. Today, there are lead films made. He had a re release this Friday uh, called Freaky Ali, and he was Ali uh, in it. So, you know, he was, he's made his mark in, f from Bajrangi Bhaijan to Freaky Ali to being in an amazing film like Lunchbox. Nawazuddin has traveled mountains, literally, to make a mark, and so has Irfan Khan. So while they can coexist, there will always be the big mainstream face. You know, that will always happen. But it doesn't take away or dilute the impact of a great actor like Nawazuddin. Everyone loves Nawazuddin. He's like Raymond. I mean, you know, it's like literally, uh, it's like you just love him. You just love him and you adore the work he does. And, you, and why generalize or, or stereotype anyone, you know? There's great work for Nawazuddin, there's great work for Ranbir, and there'll be great work for everyone. And, you know, um, like if I make a film like Edil and Mushkil, my first choice is Ranbir Kapoor. But if I make a film like Lunchbox, I would not cast Ranbir, I would cast Nawazuddin. So it really is, you're meant for certain pieces of work and some pieces of work you're just not meant for. Fantastic. Yep, right in the front. You should take this couple in the back for the next time. Go ahead. Karen, I think the whole room will agree that one of the constant themes in your films are you find a way to touch people emotionally, regardless of what the story is. I want to find out from you, who, whose work touches you emotionally? And um, who are you sparked by and give, that gives you the idea that you're ready to do your next project? Uh, whose work touches me more? There's no, I love, I, I love some of the writing of Raju Hirani. I think he's a genius writer. Uh, his work like Lage Ramuna Bhai and, uh, and Three Deaths and, um, uh, has been exceptional. Um, 
I've always loved, uh, like in terms of my contemporaries, I like the visualization of Sanjay Bansali. But whose work really has always moved me has been like movie makers of the past, which I mentioned, like Raj Kapoor, um, you know, Yash Chopra. There's been Guru Dutt, whose whose pain I just absolutely love. Like, if you want feel self indulgent in the zone of pain, then Guru Dutt is your one stop <laughs> shop. Uh, like, you know, every time like I've seen a Guru Dutt film, it like it just makes me feel like sadness is the most gorgeous thing on the face of this earth. Uh, you know, and I think it sometimes can be. You know, there's, uh, uh, like there's, I, I'll translate it, there's a saying in one of the old Hindi film song, which is, it says, Rahi manwa dukh ki chinta kyu satati hai, uh, dukh to apna sati hai. That is like, why do you fear sadness? Sadness is your friend. Uh, Sukh hai ek chhaun dhalti aati hai jati hai, which is, happiness is, um, is like, is like, it is like, like shadow, it comes in and out of your life, you know. But sadness will always be with you, and so you should treat it as your friend. And I think that's the ethos that Guru Dutt made so many of his films with. And um, I buy into it, I live by it, and I love it. So whose, whose work really moves me, it would be Guru Dutt. Uh, your second part of your question was like, what it inspires me, as I said, intuition inspires me. It's like what I feel at the moment. Um, every phase of my life, I felt different things, and that's invariably translated into the films I've made. You're so busy, I just don't know what you have time for outside of all the stuff that you do all, all, all day long, but are you a reader? Do you, uh, is that part of your day-to-day -day life? I do read, I read screenplays every day. Uh, they, they, can be, <laughs> they can be disheartening, depressing, and elevating all at the same time. Um, no, but I have all the time in the world, actually, because when you don't have a spouse or children, you have those extra eight hours in the day to, uh, <laughs> to make movies. That's my mantra. It's <laughs> great. Yep. Hi, Maha here. Hi. Nice to meet you. Well, kind of meet you. Um, firstly, I'm like a female version of you when it comes to Bollywood fanaticness. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, I wanted to know, in terms of production, we touched on Kapoor and Sons a little bit. Um, I just saw Bar Bar De Ko, which is an excellent film. I wanted to know, what do you look for when it comes to producing films? Is there, is, do you think it has any relation to what you direct? And what would a director have to do to get your attention when it comes to producing a film? Um, actually, it's my, my choice of director has always been my instinct. When they walk into the room with the screenplay and I like it and I like them, I don't have any explanation of why I choose a director. It's always based on my instinct. Um, wh whether it was Ayan Mukherjee or Karan Marotra or Shakun Batra, who made Ekme or Ek and then Kapoor and Sons for me, many of the, we, we have like nine directors working, making movies for us right at the moment. They've always been my instinct at the time that these guys are filmmakers and will make beautiful films. Um, and it's their scripts that, I make films of, for scripts that I love. Like Kapoor and Sons, for example, was a script that everyone in my company advised me not to make. Because it wasn't making sense to them. And I said, you know, and I asked them, they said, oh, it won't run, it won't be a commercial success. And I said, but did you like it? And they said, yes. I said, so don't overthink it. You know, if you like it, people will like it too. So it's simple, you have to just like what you read, it will always connect with an audience. Yep. Um, hi. Uh, sorry, I'm really emotional right now. <laughs> um, first of all, I just wanted to say that you've been such a huge part of my life, just not only just watching your films, but kind of this energy and emotion that you just give to the universe. It's always managed to reach me, so I want to thank you. No, thank you. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you, um, like you mentioned that Kabi al Kana sort of kind of changed for you as, as it grew, the audience kind of matured as well. And when you look back at it, you sort of see it from a different perspective. And that's sort of what happened to me as well. When I first watched the film, I was very little and I didn't really understand it. And that one scene with Rani and Shah Rukh, I kind of just like blocked from my memory. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cause for me it was very, it was, it was a little traumatizing for me, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> see what you've done? <laughs> Traumatized children. <laughs> But um, just recently, I actually wanted to watch it again and sort of give it another chance. And when I did, I completely understood it in a whole new light. So I see that somewhere down the line, films sort of take a life of their own. And right. having such kind of tremendous films that go on and pe that become icons and legacies that people look back to, do you ever feel that there's a moment where you become detached from it and it, you no longer see it as your film, but just sort of something that's out there in the film industry that, that people connect to, but do you ever really kind of look at it as an outsider as well at some point? Uh, mm. it's, it's actually, I'm one of those few filmmakers that doesn't like to watch his own films. Uh, I see it when I really have to, when I'm editing it and when I'm putting it together, I don't watch, I, like when it comes on TV and you know, I'm, I'm switching channels, I'm not somebody who would like to look at it and say, oh wow, what a lovely film I made. <laughs> I, I, I can't do it, like I cannot, like I, 
I was embarrassed and cringing while watching even clips from it. Like I was watching and I was like, oh my God, can this just get over with? And like, I can start speaking now because I don't want to watch anything. I was when I, that's what I said when I was standing backstage uh, when you were introducing me, watching that clipping and I was cringing. So it's like, <laughs> I, I don't, I can't say I'm detached, but I'm always squirming and embarrassed about my work. It comes from my level of insecurity, which I think is a big part of any creative person's journey. I think the moment you're too secure, you're never that talented. Uh, you stop being that talented. I think insecurity uh, and, and worry about your own creativity is what keeps you going. That's my adrenaline, is that I always think I'm messing up. Like, I've been editing Edil and Mushkil, and I was like, oh my God, it's so bad. And, <laughs> uh, and everyone in the team is like, no, it's, it's, it's great, and it's amazing. But I said that about Kuch Kuch Hota, and Kabhi Kuch Kabhi Kami, and Kalo Now, and like, I'm always saying these things about my films. I hate everything I see. But that's just my fear. It's actually my, also my, somewhere my neediness for someone else to turn around and say, no, it's actually great. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm mildly attention-seeking like that. So, um, so I say it, and the worst is when you say something that's not working and there's silence in the room, uh, when you know that, oh, oh, it really isn't working, <laughs> and you want to do something about it. Uh, so yeah, so no, to go back to your question, I am detached in that level from my, because I believe you should never fester on the work you've done, but you have to forge ahead, and every new film is a new experience. Just to follow up from that, though, um, you know, this, this, one of the incredible things about the kind of films you've made and how incredibly famous they are is that generation after generation is actually going back and watching them. And it's a sort of an interesting thing. I, as you sort of progress as a filmmaker, do you actually feel that a little bit? Are you making films that you feel can obviously resonate today and are going to have big audiences I was totally, like, when I was, for the future? Like when I made Kabi Alvida and then I made Kaini Ms. Khan, I just felt I, I had ceased to be relevant with the younger generation. So I sat one day and I said, I'm going to make high school musical. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a frivolous, fun film that has, makes no sense in the world of cinema, but it has good-looking people doing good-looking things, dancing and singing and being young and happy. And I said, when I turn 40, I want to make my youngest film. So I made Student of the Year, which is nothing like I've ever done before. Mm -hmm. It was just fun, and it looked fabulous, and it was borderline frivolous, and I loved every moment of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so did they. <laughs> I think we're on this side now. Yep, go ahead. Uh, hi, Karan. Hi. My name is Harsh. Harsh. Um, I'm working as a visual effects artist here in Toronto. Okay. My question is, like, uh, what advice would you give to young filmmakers? Like, I want to be a director probably in 10 or 15 years. Uh, that, like, when you were 23, what would you have said to yourself that would have, like, impacted you? Just go ahead and do stuff, yeah. Just do it. Like, just go ahead. Don't talk about it. Just do it. Be an AD, which is what I was. I got lucky. I got my first film break because my father was also in the movies. But if you don't come from, like, a film background, still work at it. Make movies. There's, the, today, we are such a strong part of an internet generation. You can actually put out, make a short film and put it out. Create content, put it out. Someone's going to watch it because people are as eager to watch as they are to make. So I think that you have so many platforms that you can actually put out and leverage your talent with. And that's what I believe we're in a great time. When I was making movies, there wasn't this kind of zone that we were in. We had to just kind of depend on just strong Hindi. Today, there are shorts, there are documentaries, there are films, there are YouTube videos. There are so much you can do. Take your camera, write something, go out there and make it. Friends, family, dogs, anyone in it, just go out there and make <laughs> it. Just put out content. And somewhere you'll find your voice. How do you deal with like critics? Like you know, when you're starting out, your work is not good. So, <laughs> of course, like, how do you deal with like critics? Like, well, like, you have to acknowledge that they're a force. That what they say should be taken very seriously. They're, they have opinions that should matter. Some of them are self-appointed critics. Some of them are actually academic critics. But irrespective, you have to read opinion because opinions is what shapes your career. I mean, you cannot, cannot, cannot diss those opinions. You cannot annul the existence of intellectuals or critics who give you their perspective and point of view. Um, oh, it's back. Yeah. Uh, so I'm somebody who reads, goes online when I have a release and reads everything written about my feature film. Wow. Because I need to do it. I need to do it for myself. Sometimes you want to weep, cry, melt down, and kill somebody at some of the things they've written. I've read some of the most nasty pieces of, uh, of writing about some of my work, and I've read some amazingly complimentary pieces as well. So while you accept the, the praise, you must also acknowledge the criticism. That's what makes you, and that, that accounts, if you're an artist, you must take that as your mantra for life. Please listen to the bad much more than the good, because the good somewhere you know already. It's the bad that you need to better. Great. It's a, it's a remarkably masochistic mm. practice. That well, you it do. is, but I yeah. read everything. Trust wow. me, I hashtag my film and I read everything. Amazing. 
Yes. Hi, Karan. My name is Kavita. Hi, Kavita. And I am an ardent, crazy fan of you. Like, I live, <laughs> dream, breathe, everything Bollywood. <laughs> and my show that I do, I do a TV show, and I started a group that says Conversations with Kavita, and it starts with K. Okay. Just <laughs> like you, I'm obsessed. I, I can sue you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Oh, shoot. Good to know that. <laughs> I love you. Thank you. <laughs> You're incredible, amazing, and I, I have no words to express. Like, it's like meeting an idol. So, well, that's very kind of It's Kavita, the thank you. most, this is the craziest moment of my life, you know? With a K. With a K. <laughs> <laughs> love you. So, uh, my question to you would be like one million questions, but, anyways. So, it's like, um, how do you deal with being. Uh, with your fears and coming to this epitome of success, to come to this level to understand that, you know what, you deserve that success. You deserve to be the best director in Bollywood. You deserve to be the most amazing and bring out the most amazing work in you because you owe that, owe that to the people out there. Yeah. Hmm. How, uh, do you how do I feel I, I deserve that, the success? <laughs> uh, I don't get that feeling. I don't feel, I always feel like an out of body experience when I'm at events like this. Mm -hmm. I always feel like this is not really me. And I don't mean that in a humble way. And I mean that in a true way. I was, gro I was brought up and raised by parents that always made sure that I had my feet firmly placed on the ground. Uh, every day, I have my mother who doesn't think anything of me. Uh, um, and every time I'm honored or I'm given an award or, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, invited to global platforms to speak, she's always has a questioning face. And she says that sometimes. She's like, why have they called you? Uh, uh, and like, why did you win this award? And, uh, and like, she'll always praise something else much more than mine. And she was like, oh my God, Sanjay Bansali makes such beautiful films. <laughs> and when I'm eating dinner with her, it's annoying. I know he makes beautiful films, but I don't want my mother to praise another filmmaker. I want her to just praise me. But so, uh, and my father was also exceptionally level-headed. So I don't believe my success. I don't acknowledge it to myself. I believe I work like anyone else does. And if my work is resonating with people, it's outstanding and I'm, I'm full of... The one thing that I live with every day is gratitude. And there's not a single day that I don't thank the universe for what it's given to me. And there's not a single day that I take it for granted or I don't acknowledge it. So yeah, so thankfully for my parenting and for my own sense of self that I actually don't believe my success, but I just try and work every day, every single day, and I try and do whatever I can do best to achieve and make my father's legacy proud. Thank you so much. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, my name's Marfrit. Welcome to Toronto. Thank you. Um, just wanted to say that when we came to Canada, my younger sister was only two years old, but she will still watch Kabi Kushi Gavagam and Kuch Kuch Hota any day, as many times a day as you'd like <laughs> That's her to. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, but other than that, she will not watch any Bollywood movies. So I'll, she has I'll, I'll amazing. She's a connoisseur. I, 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 I agree. I, agree. <laughs> I just want to tell you. Um, my question to you is, with success with movies like um, Bhag Milka Bhag, uh, will Dharma Productions or will you uh, ever get into the biopic? Uh, I'm genre? dying to, but all the sports personalities are booked by people already. <laughs> like everyone, like you go anywhere, everyone's making a film already about everyone. Like, you know, I did, uh, we did attempt to kind of, like we still are in the process of trying to make the story of Dhyan Chand. Oh, okay. um, and I'm sure your dad will tell you about like his, <laughs> uh, his amazing impact in the world of hockey. And he was really one of, he, he is an Olympic gold and there was so much talk this time about how like you know the Indian sports personalities haven't achieved that though with, with Sindhu I mean she really yep. did amazingly well and yep. we felt so proud. Uh, Dhyan Chand is actually a gold medalist not once but I think more than that and uh, his story needs to be told and yep. we were in collaboration trying to make it we still are so hopefully we will tell that story because I want to tell it when eventually the time and the actor is right for it. I'm sure you'll do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have one on the side. Yes go ahead ma'am. Hi Karen. Hi. Oops, I've never spoken in a mic before. That's fine. <laughs> That's all um, I do for a living. <laughs> I adore you and your movies. Thank but you. most of all, I love you on Jalak Tiklaja. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I'm not meant to be loved for Jalak Tiklaja. No, You're meant to just love me for my movies. <laughs> I do. I do. I absolutely do. I have a, my daughter here who has watched Kuch Kuch Hota like five bazillion times, and I have watched it with her, and we have weeped through it. Right. So That's the we, idea. And I laughed all my way to the <laughs> bank. 
<laughs> every every time you every tear you shed, every tear you shed was a dollar in my bank. <laughs> <laughs> but when you start doing your thumkas and chatkas on Jhalak uh, Dikhaja, it just brings so much joy to my life. I don't know. <laughs> 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 you know, I have. I have. <laughs> No, 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 you're not going to see that here. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a, I'm, this is a very prolific platform and it's a prestigious platform and I refuse to do it. Uh, what happens to me oh, is... Oh, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> no, not at all. What happens to me is when I'm on that show and it's a dance-based show and the song comes on and they ask me to do it, um, it's also because that's the need of the hour. It's a television dance show. And the thing is, when you're Punjabi, it's kind of with the territory, right? Indian. It's like in your, the, those kind of, that rhythm is in your, and I was always this frustrated movie star in my head. Uh, I always wanted to do those dance sequences which like 300 dancers. So this time, uh, we went on a tour right through North America with the Dream Team. And I actually was introduced and I had to do like a two and a half medley minute on Dharma songs. And in my head, I was like, this is crazy. I'm a filmmaker. I can't believe I'm walking out on stage with 40 dancers dancing behind me and I'm going to dance for two and a half minutes. I'm not meant to be doing this. So in my head, how do I achieve this? The only way to achieve it is if I believe I'm a huge movie star in my head and this is what I do for a living. And I did it. Unapologetically, I enjoyed every bit of it. I, I, when I look at it, I'm embarrassed. I don't look at it. I don't no, go on YouTube. Don't. No, I don't want to. Because I think that if I look at it, I'll stop doing it. So. But, but the thing that's fun for me is when I watch you dance and the look of utter joy on your face yeah. is what makes it so fun. Because I'm actually, as I said, I'm living a dream. Yeah. Like everything I ever did as a child, like I thought like, oh, I should be, my father once sat me down and said, you know, like all Punjabi fathers are, all Indian fathers are, are, are sometimes, uh, they are what you call deluded. Uh, they, think, they think that their children are like the most beautiful piece, like mothers are, all mothers and fathers. Like, so my father sat me down very seriously and said, you know, you're so beautiful, you're a hero. So, and I was like, and I was intelligent enough even then to know that he was not making sense. <laughs> so I, at that point of time, I was like, oh my God, like he's totally off mark. Like, you know, and like, how can I be a hero? I don't have the personality, the body language, oh, yeah. or the looks for it. And he was like, puppy fat hai yaar, chala jayega. <laughs> and, and he was like, wo chala jayega and you should become a hero. And he, he, he called my obesity at that time, puppy fat. That was just, the, it's, it's the vision of it, right? You know, so I love my dad and he thought I was a hero. But even then I realized that he wasn't making any sense. So I didn't follow that instruction. But that movie star, Kira, was in my system. So I said, I, I, one day I, should, I wish I could act. I wish I could dance on a stage. I wish I could host a talk show because I was obsessed by a talk show I used to watch on Doordarshan that used to be the only channel that played in India. There was a lady called Tabassum. Senior members yes. of this audience will know who Tabassum is. <laughs> She used to have one rose in her hair and she used to ask movie questions and I was like, I'm going to be Tabasum one day. <laughs> and, and then I, of course, enjoyed the works of Raj Kapoor and Yash Chopra and I said, I'm going to be a director one day. And uh, I'm, I'm very um, thankful that I've done it all. <laughs> I danced on stage, I hosted a talk show, I made a movie. Um, I mean, I, I did everything that I ever dreamt of as a child. So I always tell parents, you know, like the one thing that you cannot stop your child from doing is dreaming because dreams do become realities. Yeah. So my Thank question... You so oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> There's one? Oh my yes. God. Go ahead. Go ahead. My question <laughs> is that you have so many different platforms through which you express yourself. Your movies, your direction, your coffee with current show, your reality shows, your dance. There's so many different things. Your blog, which I read, your, right. your columns. Thank you. Which is the most true current? The one that stands behind the camera and directs the film. Thank you. Uh, that is to me, uh, that is who I am. Everything else is a result of who I am. In the back. Hi, Karan. I'm Sabah. Hi, Sabah. Hi. Um, so, I know that we're going to get a little tease of Shah Rukh and Adil, but I'm just wondering, when will we see you, I guess the world will also wants to know, when will we see you and Shah Rukh team up once again? Well, hopefully very soon, uh, God willing. Uh, he's, a, he's somebody, as we discussed in the interview, uh, we have such great actor-director chemistry that I can't wait to direct him again. Hopefully very soon, inshallah, I will think of a film and we will ca come together as, as, as a humongous duo. Nice. <laughs> nice. Look forward to it. All the best for Adil. Great. Sounds like a good title to start with, too. Yeah. Um, yep. Go ahead. I was kind of interested in what you were saying about the writing and that being a problem, uh, that there was not fresh writing coming up that you were satisfied with. Right. I was wondering what you were thinking about 
how they were going to solve this problem. What did you think about solving this problem? Well, I can only do that by, by starting the process of empowering writers within my own fold, which is what we're doing. We're actually now getting a lot of new writing talent. We're starting a division that is a writing division in Dharma Productions, which is my company, and getting new writers to actually put out content, which we can then you know, you know, develop and then make into full-length feature films. So at my end, that's what I'm doing. I'm empowering the writer. I'm putting my money where my mouth is, literally. I hope they are, they should, because writing is the soul and the backbone of any feature film. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Um, and I think that, I hope they are, because I think that everyone has realized that content is king, and movie star is no longer king, but content is definitely king. It's fantastic. It's, very, it's really unusual, right, to have, I mean, it's almost like an old school Hollywood studio, kind of with the writer's rooms and the... Exactly, uh, that's yeah. what we need to do, is yeah. to, what we started doing on, on, like a, on a regular basis now. It's really exciting. Yep. Hi, sir. Hi. My name is Swapnil. And I'm a Ma Maharashtrian guy. Okay. I came here in the month of Jan. Uh, I have a very simple question for you. Do you have any project for Ranveer Singh and Alia Bhatt? Do you have any project for Ranveer yeah. Singh and Alia Bhatt? Any Bhatt? romantic movie? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> okay, thank uh, you. They'd, they'd, they'd make a great pair. but Because I... they have a very huge fan following in, in India. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. They, 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 yeah. They're brilliant <laughs> actors, both of them. Uh, but I'm sure somebody's going to think of this combination and come up with it. I mean, even Ranbir Kapoor and Alia Bhatt would be great. Ranbir Singh and Alia Bhatt would be great. Um, Alia Bhatt and anyone would be great, I think. But no Alia Bhatt is great. Okay. Thank so you. Much. <laughs> yep. Uh, where do we have? Here we go. Thank you. Hi, Hi. Karan. Oh, wow, this is really loud. <laughs> Hi. So. You have had the experience of being an actor as well, and you did an amazing performance in Bombay Velvet. What I'd like to know is what's it, well, at least I thought it was amazing. I thought you were amazing. That was, no, for me, I was, because I it's was, something I it's was, different. I was amazing. You were. I, 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 the rest happening around me was pretty much not. <laughs> As someone who's grown up in, you know, with Hollywood and Bollywood, watching Bombay Velvet was something extremely different for me to watch, and it inspires it me, and makes me want to go into Bollywood and help create content. Because like you that. saw Bombay Velvet. Because I saw Bombay Velvet, it hit here. I'm making sure Anurag Kashyap knows this because I keep teasing him. I'm like, I'm everywhere, and I'm defending Bombay Velvet on global <laughs> platforms. Why have you done this to me? I didn't even produce or direct that film. <laughs> So my question is for you, as a director and then having the experience as an actor, are there big differences or similarities between act, being a director, being an actor? Like, what's, what's it like from having all the control then to then being directed? I don't know. I can only tell you about my experience when I was acting in Bombay Velvet. I was really bored. Because I was like, the actors get too much time in between. There's so little they have to do in the whole day, and they just have to sit with hair and makeup and just sit and listen to instructions and act. I mean, like, what's the big deal? I was, I was like, completely, like, I enjoyed being, doing that because it was a different facet to my personality. But I was really bored because I had these gap days in between the schedules. We were in Sri Lanka filming, and I was really bored. And beyond and above a point, it was like, I had to wear a mustache that was irritating me. And um, I, I was, I was bored. <laughs> like, I was like, being, uh, and then Anurag is such an unusual filmmaker that he puts the camera in a place that you can't see. So you, all you were doing was just looking like, where, where's the camera? And, and, and for some reason, he pretended like I've done this about 20 times before. So he didn't feel the need to give me any instruction. He would just leave me loose into the frame. And like, I had to cultivate what I had to do. So I went, went through a lot of like, interesting energies while that film was happening. From boredom to like, fear, like, what am I doing? To like, like, at the end of the day, like, I much prefer direction it's so much more exciting and challenging than being an actor and I don't this that I love movie stars and actors and I think they're all gifted but I was bored um, and actually that maybe that resulted in me not getting a single acting offer after Bombay Velvet uh, I was really shattered about that no one offered me a single role after that even not even a bad one that I could refuse uh, I felt like you know I was so happy with like myself and I was like oh I can actually act it's not bad that now I have to say no to people when they come to me not a soul came to me I was like, I'm still waiting, not a soul. It's really <laughs> shattering. That's why. I really want to refuse a role. <laughs> 
Did it, um, did it change after that experience? Did it change how you treated your actors on set? Totally, with great amounts of regard, because they, I knew that like, I, I, didn't, I would always remember their call time should be only when they really need to be on set. Because waiting around and pottering around doing nothing in hair and makeup is not the most exciting thing. I'm not used to that also. I was so used to being on set. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, working in actors and like, and, and somehow when you're, an, when you're a director, you tend to know the scene so well that I tend to kind of like do the same. I, I used to know everyone else's dialogues as well when I was reading the scene, because that was what I do as a director. So I found myself, the only times I would like do something wrong on set as an actor is when I was actually lip syncing somebody else's lines, because <laughs> I wasn't realizing that I knew his lines as well. <laughs> so you were giving them a line reading while yeah, you were acting, I was like, great. Yeah, I was, I, was like, I was like literally like a teleprompter on that film. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for a couple more. There's one over here, I think. Hi, Karan. Hi. My name is Amin. Hi. You're my big, you're my favorite director. Is Thank that what you. I want to say? Thank uh, my you. question is, you work with the biggest Bollywood stars, Shah Rukh Khan, Rani Mukherjee, Kajol, Amitabh Bachchan, Hrithik Roshan. I want to ask, you mentioned this, you, 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 you said this earlier that, about the idea of Stoner of the Year. I want to ask, when did the idea of that come from? And what was the idea behind not only producing, but directing Stoner of the Year and launching the pad for three superstars, future superstars, since you work with the biggest stars? When did the idea of working with young stars come in mind? Uh, to feel young? Uh, uh, predominantly, like I said, at 40, I wanted to make my youngest film, and I felt I needed to be relevant to that generation, to the 10 and 12 year olds who will grow up, who will know me. So today, like, you know, a 10 year old who saw Kuch Kuch Hota is now 14 and knows who I am. So important, relevance is very critical. To be relevant constantly with an audience space is very essential for any filmmaker. And I think my endeavor with Student of the Year was just that, to remain relevant. And that's why I needed to cast young to create pop culture icons, which is what I'm glad happened with Student of the Year, Siddharth and Varun and Alia, all because became like teenage aspirations. And I think that was the whole idea behind Student of the Year. It wasn't to move any cinema mountains. I know I wasn't planning to with that film. And when I saw it, like I, I told everyone who was a cinephile and somebody who loves, I said, don't see it. It's not your cup of tea or coffee. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> but um, the part of the question which I thought was kind of interesting is also, you know, you've, you've had this incredible role of sort of, you know, kind of having these actors sort of develop these extraordinary careers and you've been a big part of that. Yeah. So with that experience with these young actors, do you play a certain role in sort of helping them shape their futures? Well, it is. It is. I mean, you almost, I, I feel like I'm, I've not just I've launched them into the world of cinema, but also you have to mentor and parent them on a daily basis. Um, I'm like, me and like uh, Matrix that handles them, Reshma Shetty, um, uh, who also handles the three careers. You, I, we feel like both of us feel like we're mom and dad to them. Like you know, <laughs> it's like constantly like, don't do this, do this, say this, don't say this. It's like a big. When I take on the mantle of actually introducing talent within the fold of the company, it's very critical that we take it through right till the end of their journey. You know, um, that you know, you just don't launch them and leave them into the world. You part, you build their careers with them. Mm -hmm, fantastic. I think we have maybe two more. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Hello, Mr. Karan Johar. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hi. Hello. Uh, Mr. Johar, today there are Indians living in every part of the world. Across the world, uh, in each corner of the world, one thing which gives Indian a, an identity is Hindi cinema. Right. It is the Bollywood films which actually gives them a recognition. Um, as an icon of contemporary Bollywood, you have made some of the most iconic movies in the last 20 years. So what role do you see of Bollywood in enhancing this global Indian identity? Uh, I think it's a tremendous role. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a tremendous role. It's all, almost bringing like, you, the universe closer, the world closer. I think Indian cinema has definitely been lapped up by not just the diaspora, but because the extent of the success it's had and the impact it's had, be its music, its content, its genre that is so unusual. Like we are the only Indian, we're the only cinema in the world that actually breaks its narrative. We have an interval. And you know, that doesn't happen in any other cinema of the world. The uniqueness of our cinema has attracted so many parts of Europe, the Middle East, America, like like who are actually now no, not just calling us a song and dance singing nation that makes movies, you know, that, you know, Bollywood, which is actually a mock terminology, which I'm not happy with, but when the Queen sanctioned it in the Oxford Dictionary, we had to grow to live with it. That <laughs> Bollywood is now an existing term that we can't do anything about. It's called Bollywood now, so be it. But we're not a poor cousin of Hollywood. We stand tall as a unique filmmaking nation. And I think, <laughs> and I think, 
the fact that we are so unusual, like we had, like we've had screenplay gurus come and talk to us about the three act structure that Hollywood lives by. But we have an interval; it doesn't apply to us. <laughs> we actually, we actually peak twice in a film, and it's unique. And within peaking twice, we make some great films. We have legendary music, and we have some of the best talent in the world, and we can stand tall anywhere with our cinema. And I think we should be proud of it. So I get, I get most annoyed when I when people ask me, "Do you want to win an Oscar?" No. I don't want to. If I get it, I'll be really happy. I'll put it up very proudly on my mantle, along with my film fair or my national award. But to <laughs> me, making a great film, making a great piece of work that actually resonates with the global audience, and I don't want to make something that emulates anyone else. We are a cinema that is so individualistic that we've stood tall for decades, from the time of Alamara, which was our first silent film, right down to like the latest film that released last Friday. We've evolved. We have some great talent. Yes, we've succumbed to some of the uh, some of the failings of like lack of quality, but so has Hollywood. So has every other cinema in the world. Uh, and I think we need to celebrate our individuality, and which is what we do on a daily basis. So to answer your question, we are relevant. We are going to grow from strength to strength, and eventually, a decade later, hopefully, I'm invited back to Toronto with a film that you will be very proud of. <laughs> Okay, we got one more. Make it good. Hi, Karen. <laughs> Welcome to Toronto. Hi, thank you so much. Um, these are just frivolous kind of questions. What was your most favorite scene to shoot? What is, which scene made you the most emotional? And what is your most favorite song to sing in the shower? And can you <laughs> sing it for us? <laughs> no, I can't sing it. Which is my favorite scene of my own films? Yeah. Uh, there's a dining table sequence in Kabi Alvidana Kena, uh, which ends with Mr. Bachchan saying, good joke. Uh, I don't know anyone who's seen Kabi Alvida. It's, it's the dining table. It's my f I, I think it's, it's my favorite piece of work, just the with dynamics of that scene. Um, which was the second, was my favorite? Uh, what was the scene that made you the most emotional? Emotional. It was a scene where Shah Rukh and Kajal meet each other after eight years and kuch kuch hota hai. Yeah. Uh, and there's that awkwardness in their body language, and I played the sad version of Kuch Kuch Hota Hai. Um, that, that I remember crying behind the monitor at that time, and I cried to the extent that I had to kind of run out of my own set because I was so embarrassed that I was weeping copiously because I was so excited that what I had imagined was executed with such brilliance. Um, that, and the third song, what do I sing? Uh, I can't, I'm, I'm the worst singer in the universe, so I can't sing at all. But I'm a big fan of the old music. And like I mentioned, like Lag Jagale is uh, my favorite song of all times. Um, it's a song that makes me feel happy within its sadness. And I think Madan Mohan and Lataji, which is the, the combination that actually, that song. So I, for those who don't know it, go back home today and tune into a song called Lag Jagale, which Lata Mangeshkar has composed way back in the 60s. It is the most beautiful song that you will hear. It'll make, it'll, it'll really, as they say, warm the cockles of your heart. Darling, I wish I could sing for you, but I really, I, I really feel like, you know, I would like you to sleep better tonight. So, uh, and I might land up giving you a, a glorious nightmare if I sang, so I would Though I have to tell you, when I was three, about eight years old, I believed I used to sing really well. Um, in my head, I was hitting all the right notes. So we had a talent contest in school, and we were all supposed to do what we did best. And my mother didn't have the heart to tell me that I shouldn't be singing, because she had heard me sing as a child. And I insisted. I, say, I thought I was really a brilliant singer. So there's a song, an English song called A Song of Love is a Sad Song. Hi, Lily, hi, Lily, hi, hello. It's a song. It's called, <laughs> and I sang it, gala phaad phaad ke, like literally, like, you know, <laughs> thinking like I was hitting all the right souls, like Muhammad Rafi. And I, and I sang it, and there was just utter silence. Even at eight, I remember, there was just silence. And I thought they just swept off their feet with my, <laughs> with my beautiful singing. And after that, I actually had the cheek to tell my mother, we have to wait for the award ceremony. Because I actually thought I was going to win. <laughs> and then I didn't win, and I was crestfallen, and I wept a little bit. And on my way back, my mother held my hand, and she says, Karan, you're a bright, talented young boy. Just don't sing. <laughs> you can do everything else, don't sing. So at, a very, at the tiny age of eight, I was warned about my singing ability. And at 44, nothing has changed. I still can't sing. <laughs> well, we're extremely happy you took the pathway you did, and we hope to see you back in Toronto for 10 Thank years. You. Karan Johar. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.